now, the Bram Weinstein Show on Washington's new home for sports, ESPN 630. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hi, everyone. I'm busy. Hi, everyone. A lot of Ted noise today. Hi, everyone. A lot of Ted noise. Ted Day. Ted Day. Stop your talk about Benjamin Johnson for a moment. (laughs) Benjamin Johnson. I don't want to hear any more about Benjamin Johnson or Robert Slowick. I'm done with all of it. We're going to talk about Wesley. We're going to talk about Potomac Yards. (laughs) Mr. Yunkin, my friend. We're going to talk about that. How long did it take you to get through that email? Oh, I, ooh, yeah, I, you know me. I like all Ted content. You know me. I, may, I make fun of them because I love them. I, I can't help it. I love them. You know I love them deep down. The that's first, what it is. I had to read the first half, mm-hmm. then go get a haircut, then continue reading the second <laughs> half afterwards. Listen, considering <laughs> he hasn't taken a single question from anybody about this, sure. I will give him credit for this was a lot. He did put out is a lot. It, though? it is. I I uh, I actually responded on LinkedIn, my preferred platform, <laughs> to the letter and it's one wrote. Thing I don't have and wrote in a commentary there. You can go check my oh, check oh, me. Oh, I did. Okay. I wrote in a commentary that I would like to start by saying I still agree with this. I know I'm in the minority of it, but I do. But I would like to point out that transparency would be helpful here, mm-hmm. and I believe that it would be helpful and instructive for all of us. If you started doing some interviews with independent media about this, pick and choose who it is. Like, talk to the Washington Post, talk to Kojo Nundi, talk to Tom Sherwood, talk to NBC4, do an extensive interview. Talk to me if you want. Do an extensive interview with independent media so we can talk about all of these aspects because it's a long conversation. And Because as you pointed out, he wrote a diatribe <laughs> because this is... A very, very, very complicated situation. He's Testament. trying to pretend it isn't, actually, but it, but it really is, and everybody knows that. So I appreciate that he finally put something out about it. Feels like a little daylight dollar short. It's like, the bare minimum. We're, like, yeah, it is the bare I mean, that's minimum. That's what I'm saying. He did address most of the issues. Like, there were very few things that he sure. did not ad- at least address in it. Now, we can talk about whether he addressed them in a way that's satisfactory. Okay. All right. Right. And I do want to start with, okay, I'm going to go through it. We're going to go through you it. You are cliff note- noting this, right? Because it it'll thing. take us 50 minutes no, to go no, through no, the No, whole no, thing. no. I'm cl- of course I'm cliff noting it. <laughs> I'm going to get to the headlines. But okay. I do want to start with paragraph three or whatever it is in the first part that sets it up. We have uh, because an outline, paragraph three, I got, I got this. <laughs> I've, got this, I've got this marked up. If I was teaching a class, I've got this marked my, uh, up. My yeah. old Catholic school uh, instincts are kicking in doing, you know, we do a not Genesis 1114 today. Yes. Turn to your Bibles. That's right. That's right. Turn to page four. We're going to skip the preamble. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, right? right. Let's just all assume that we know who Jesus is. Let's just get to page four in the skip first the controversial the, yeah, moment. Skip okay? the part about the stonings. Correct. Go, go, go down. Go, go down. down here. Here's the part we're going to pay attention to. All right. So this is this is overarching leading into why I'm going to explain everything to you paragraph that I thought was my favorite part of actually the whole thing, which was this. I believe in the DMV and will always be an advocate for our extended community. I keep that part in mind. That's a very important word, very important wording. Mm -hmm. He wants everybody to understand we're not going everywhere. We're one. Okay. So so this is part of the sales job. It's not Maryland District, Virginia. It's the DMV and we're all one. Can I, can I, by the way, I'm just going to chime in here because it, it did occur to me today. We kind of made fun of the uh, boundary stone thing yeah. because then he, he said they, they announced it and then they wore the boundary stone stuff. Yes. But the boundary stones did also extend into Virginia for the original diamond. Uh-huh. People were making fun of that. Now, uh, it occurred to me today, this has actually been like in the works for a while. Remember, you have the hoodie. I have the hoodie. It says DMV, DMV. on it. Yes. Like this is a... He's well, been, but he's been talking work. about this for a long. Like, I don't know why he's not buying the Orioles. He's been talking about this for a long time. Super that region. he sees a super region. Yeah, I don't disagree with that vision yeah. that extends down to you know to Richmond that doesn't have any professional teams. Right. It kind of cuts off at North Carolina because they have a lot of professional teams. It used to not be that way, but they do now. So it extends down to Southern Virginia. There's a large Commander fan base down in Norfolk right, but- and, and Tidewater in those areas. A huge Commanders fan base down there. So like, it does extend all the way down there. And I would assume. 
that if there are regional basketball fans that have any alliances, it would be to the Wizards. There's no one yeah. else that's close. So yeah. I would I believe that. Like I don't disagree with him. He think it extends up to Baltimore too, which is why I've always said I don't know why. Forget the Nationals. Go buy the Orioles. Like, if you want to extend the brand and do the regionalization that includes Baltimore down to Richmond, why aren't you buying the Orioles then yeah. and then intertwining all the teams? Right. I would just say this and push back on his super thing. Uh, Boston, Philly, and New York want nothing to do with each other, and it's, like, almost the same. Yeah, but no, but but those are big, major markets. Okay, I'm just saying it's this. It's, 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 it's Richmond's a much smaller city no, than Washington. No, I know. Washington. It's growing, though. Yeah, it's but there's though. no professional teams down there. And like, what about so, the flying squirrels there, okay, Han? Let, well, let me ask this, then. Would the Giants or the Jets or the Knicks or the Rangers, all those, would they include New Jersey and Connecticut? They uh, would, I guess. I mean, in, in terms of like their fan bases and to. reach, <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, some of them play there, yeah, right. You know, so like, so I think, like, I understand what he's saying. Like, there is no professional team in Connecticut, sure. so the New York teams are Connecticut's teams. Yeah, yeah, right. Northern New Jersey's teams are the Jets and the Giants and whoever. Southern New Jersey's teams are the Sixers and you know yeah. whoever. So like, I get it. Like, I told, I get what he means by this. But then he said this. So. Number one, I wanted to point out, he says, extended community. Yes. That's important here. He is priming you for, we're all one. Stop talking about it like it's regional. Like, we're moving to Virginia and we're turncoats. He doesn't want you to think that way, okay? Which I agree with him. I go to Arlington all the time. I don't feel like I'm, like, invading. Sure. You know, like, I feel like it's part of my community. Anyway, he goes on to say this, and I loved this sentence. My goal is to always take the high road, and I believe I have lived up to that. Now, by saying that out loud, it means you want to scream at us. It does. It means that you don't like the <laughs> criticism you've gotten and you've kept your mouth shut, but you just can't keep it shut any longer. And I waited. <laughs> once, he, once he wrote that, I went, where's he going to yell at everybody? Uh, and he didn't really do that. He's a great writer. He's very measured well, in the way he writes. I, so, like, we'll go through it. But, like, that line got me because I'm like— how could the PR people have approved that? Because all you're saying is, I have wanted to scream back and clap back to everybody who's yeah. been yelling at me about this, but I've chosen not to do so. Give me my points for that. And I was a little like, I hear you, but you don't need to tell me that. Like It's like when you have a fight with your significant other and they go, I've wanted to say something to you about this for a long time. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, yeah. why didn't you? Correct. How about that? I, I yeah. will say this, because you even said at the beginning of this segment, it's a little bit late. But I give it Ted is. credit here for letting it fester for a little bit, letting him feel his feelings, and then putting out in a way where it's not attacking. Because I think you you and I know this. Sports owners have a habit of doing this, of lashing out. Yeah. And it gets ugly. Like, like it never looks good when they kind of pull the spoiled brat line because they know right. they can because they're a billionaire right so well, that, like he's not going to have any real standing with the common folk because we're all looking at this right. and like listen ted i love you but like no one's lining up behind you. Well, you're not running for president where we yeah. have to we have to give you our loyalty pledge correct we can be mad about this we're your paying customers That's right, right? That's never right. forget that part we're your paying customers here yes uh <laughs> To, to, to that point, just real quick, because you will get to it, but there was a line in here that I saw when he was like, like many of you, I drive to work every day. And I was kind of like, dude. With you, a driver. I was like, dude, <laughs> your arena has all six. Maybach. All, <laughs> also, your arena has all six Metro lines on it. Yeah. That's why we love it. I know. They, like, there are there are some. Was a few things I know. I was like, why did you just? You should have just left that out, man. Like, right, leave it out. So the first part <laughs> was. By, by the way, we're gonna get to it, but they put Wes's record in the PR thing today, I and I was like, no, you're st you're le you're you're leaving him in the organization. You don't need to give his 400 record there. Anyways, sorry. so all right. So he says I'm gonna take the high road. Okay, got it. Right, so I was fine. waiting for when are you gonna yell at me? Yeah, is yeah, it right. sound because you're you're priming me for you want to yell at me? Right, okay. Right. No, he said, these are the two critical objectives of the at the heart of the decision, is what he said, which I appreciate. This is his reasoning. Yes. Yeah, One, yeah. provide our fans with the best experience in all of sports. Great. From getting in and out of the arena efficiently. That's the first line. From getting in and out of the arena efficiently. So <laughs> your detractors, Ted, fairly are going to tell you. The one that you have currently is very easy to get in and out of the efficiently. Out of all the arenas here. Yes. Arenas and stadiums. I'll include Baltimore, too. Out of all of them, it is the easiest one to get in and out of. Okay. He goes on to say this. Uh, to food and beverage experiences. Okay. You can do that anywhere. Yep. Okay. Right. To improve lines of sight from all seats. 
Okay, I'll hear you on that, but I got to tell you, I don't think a lot of people complain about the viewpoints in Capital One anyway. No. To in-game entertainment. Basketball, yes. Basketball, okay. I would say. To yes. in-game entertainment, you could do that anywhere. To hospitality spaces, I don't know enough to answer that one. Yep. Next generation technology, again, you can do that anywhere. You can implement those things literally anywhere. He goes, and then he said all this stuff like better sound systems. I agree. Maybe that's not up to date. and Maybe a new arena needs that, but okay. Right. So he basically laid out a lot of things. And what I would point out is, while I agree with you that this should be a paramount reason to want to do this, the things you just named, many of which already exist. That's right. Yep. So it's a hard sell to tell me you need a brand new arena in a new part of town if I'm willing to regionalize it with you. Because you need the things that you could easily implement into your stadium now. Yep. Food and beverage experiences, you could do whatever you want there. You have the arena, put whoever you want there. And in fact, it's not I, hard. I would actually say he's upgrade done a- the upgrade the the technology and access to Wi-Fi and all this stuff. Why can't you do that there? What what, what Verizon can't do that for you? Like, what are you talking about? I would argue yeah. this too. He's done a great job rotating stuff through that arena. Like, it's yes. actually it's actually if you go, let's say you go to Capital One Arena and you don't go back for two years. It tends to be actually very different from the last time you went. There's a yes. lot of rotating things, a lot of different. He does the kiosks now where you don't even have to swipe your card. You just go in and grab. I, it already exists. That's what I don't really I, I agree. Uh, number two reason for, the, for doing this is establish a best-in-class set of facilities for our athletes and employees. Great. It's a good reason. And I agree with this part of it. They have, whether you want to hear this or not, outgrown the footprint there yes okay yep. and i agree with them on that which was part of the reason why i've been on his side about this going look like we're in a new age of sports real estate's a big part of the whole thing you need a bigger footprint people go for you know these lands now yeah. um and for them to grow and to remain competitive on this landscape you are going to have to do that and i know a lot of people don't want to hear it and would it have been awesome if they just went to the rfk site Sure. I think right. it would have same, pro, you know, same thing. But like, I hear him on that. And like, so on this part of it, I agree. But he does mention this one thing and is the one thing that everybody's very concerned about. He said this multiple traffic analyses are underway to determine infrastructure needs related to the building of the entertainment district. We also believe this investment will be a catalyst for supporting and improving Metro, which benefits residents and businesses in Virginia, Maryland and Washington, D.C. They're only going to improve that one. Yeah. They're not going to improve right. the whole line because of yes. this. Like, as the Metro people made it very clear when this came out, because they were surprised by this, they said, you know, no one talked to us because yeah. we would tell you it can't support what you're talking about. Correct. And therefore, you'd have to invest X amount of dollars, which is probably why you didn't talk to me about it first. But at least he's acknowledging that it has to happen. Because when he says in the first one, we want in and out of the stadium being a big function of what we do, you already have that. Yeah. In fact, right. I don't know that you could do better with where you currently are right now yes. with the metro <laughs> access and the availability of parking everywhere. Even on Saturday nights, I don't have a problem figuring out a way to yes. either go through right. their lots, find mm -hmm. a lot, or just take the metro. The efficiency of it is part of its charm, frankly. It, correct. No, no, totally. Like I actually literally talked about this this morning with somebody. Uh, I had a friend text me and say, hey, do you want to go to this concert? Uh, for, for someone, and I said, where's it at? And they said, um, Jiffy Lube. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm out. I'm, I, right. I, it's horrible to get to. There's traffic all the time. Getting back sucks. The traffic, the traffic sucks. But if there's a, ever a concert, and you and I have been through this, at Capital One Arena, even if I'm half in, I'm like, I'll go. Because I can metro down there. I can drive down there. It's an easy ride home. That is part of the allure of the arena that I like going to all of your events, not just the sporting events, but the concerts, too, because of the ease of getting down there. So, once again, you have all six lines yes. right there. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I just feel like this, I, I feel like we're watching RFK again. Like, you're taking for granted how easy it is to get to that place. And people are going to tell you real fast whether they love it or hate it, essentially. So, on issue one, provide our fans with the best experience in all of sports. I'll see it when I, I'll believe it when I see it, sure. but I don't think you have a bad spot here, and that's where I think some people would push back. Yep. On two, establish best-in-class set of facilities. I agree with you. That doesn't exist right now, yep. and this offers you the opportunity for that. So I'm on your side about that, Ted. Mm -hmm. I actually am. Now, there are issues with it. You are acknowledging it, but I'm. On, this is why I'm on your side about some of this stuff. One thing I will say, and this is something that people don't talk about Capital One Arena a lot, the actual locker room uh, situation is bad. Like, and I agree with him on this part of it. Um, they also have 58 locker rooms in there, right? Right. And uh, it so is so they could 
they, they could alter that. They could, but they, it's it's consistently voted as the worst visiting locker room by both the NBA and the NHL. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard the description of the showers there, but it's like one tube that comes down and spits water everywhere it's compared to a prison. <laughs> I it's like a, that. Which, it's funny because it's like, it it's the away funny. team. Who cares? All right, who cares? But basically, I've also heard the same thing. And, and like, you might know if you've been down there during games, there's not enough room in the, of, of the visiting locker room. So yeah. guys are getting warmed up in the hallway while workers are walking by. Like, you and I know this. There are advantages when... Another team is coming in. You want to make it kind of difficult, but some of the things they have to go through are a little bit embarrassing, as in not having enough space. Like, that's a bad one. So I do, I'm with you on this one. I agree they could make that better. But to your point, too, you can, there's a lot of space down there. You can knock some walls down and rejigger everything if you really, really wanted to do that, too, and make new locker rooms and new showers and all of that. So. Okay. So those are his two guiding forces, yes. right? Whether we agree or disagree, right. I agree on some Fine. of it with him. Right. right. So now he gets to the political portion of this <laughs> argument, which is, and one of the major pushbacks is, you're leaving downtown D.C., and we'll get to the part where it may crumble downtown D.C., which he acknowledges later, yeah. and he's moving to Virginia, of which I'm on his side about this part, too. The overreact, What I always describe as an overreaction to where he was moving He's not moving them to Tampa, Florida. He's moving them to sure. Alexandria. Right. It is not that far away. It is not outside of the region, and I agree with him. But he's heard it so much that he's decided, and his PR team has decided, that they are going to promote something they're calling one DMV. So this is part of the messaging that they want to go with. We're all one big community. Mm -hmm. Stop separating it. You know it's not true. You and I cross the borders all the time. I go. I work in Virginia with the commanders. I live in Maryland. I go into D.C. for my work. It is one big place for me that I frequent almost every day all three regions. And I'm not unusual. A lot of people do this. They live in Virginia and they work in D.C. They live in Maryland. They work in Virginia. We all understand this. And I agree but so he's decided, though, and they've decided we need to get everybody thinking this way, that we're one region, not Maryland, D.C. and Virginia. OK, no, to try to <laughs> no to try to no. no? <laughs> you don't feel like Arlington is part of our is part of your community you, living in Bethesda because it is very close and you go there. A no, lot. No, no, like, I don't even no, I don't see fine. it as different. That's fine. But I like individuality and in each each region has their own individuality. That's fine, but okay, L.A. encompasses a lot of sure. neighborhoods yes. that we call right. L.A. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Echo Park. Yeah. You know, like, you could name a million different areas out there that everyone calls Los Angeles that is not downtown Los Angeles. That's all he's saying here. Arlington, Tyson's, Bethesda, Gaithersburg, Washington, D.C., Prince George's County. It's all one big community is what he's trying to say. And I don't disagree with that notion. But the fact that he has to try to point it out tells me that more people are like you going, uh-uh, no, 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 player, we're not. And you are moving them out. But he seems to need to – he seems the, the need to try to convince people that he's not, which I on, I'm on his side on that. I don't believe that he is. Like, I don't feel like they're moving very far away. They're but just going to a different locale. This is, though – this is like a problem with, like, society in general, though, and I think some people would agree with me, is, like, don't paint us all as one generic place. There are these nuances. There are neighborhoods. Agreed. Like – me growing up in Maryland, my experience was different than the kids in Arlington or were different from the kids in D.C. And in D.C., in fact, D.C., you've got like all these different wards. There were a ton of different walks of life all within a yeah. a very small radius. So I'm just I, all I'm saying is I don't like it to be painted as one area because it is actually really, really unique. You know full well people that grew up on Capitol Hill, completely different than the ones that grew up here in Friendship Heights. I mean, that's sure. like a, that's a different animal. Sure. So, I'm just so saying, I'm all just right. saying, I don't like that, that it's, he's trying to make it one brush stroke is all I'm saying. On this DMV idea, he starts off with, I moved here at a, in 1970s. I've stayed here. I raised my family. I've seen all the changes. He points out that they've already done things with the teams in the various jurisdictions. True. Nobody's freaked out about Who that. Hasn't like done that, the practice facility for them was in Odenton a long time ago. Right. And then suddenly it's in Boston. And sure. It's a beautiful practice. So. He's like, we've kind of done this already. You know, the Capitals played in Maryland for a long time. Now they play in Washington. Like, so he's, he's priming all of that. And then he wrote this, which you thought was funny. Like many of you, each day I, when I drive to the office, I pass through Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. I believe our region is uniquely positioned to compete with other large metropolitan areas. I would describe it as we already do. But <laughs> since when do we not? We're top 10 market. 
we're like top five. Like, <laughs> since when do we not? Are, but anyway, he's trying to say, like, I don't believe we are second fiddle to Chicago, Los Angeles, or New York. We're the political center of the universe. Like, right. I don't, what are you talking about? Anyway, right. he said this. In the DMV, if one wins, we all win. This was true with Amazon HQ2, and I believe it not will be finished true. Not yet. Not true, <laughs> right. And I believe it will be true with our project as well. Okay. No. Bad example. Bad example. Like, like terrible example. <laughs> really bad example. And, and this is where, you know, I respectfully, Ted, you own sports franchises. You don't own the largest global commerce company right. on earth. And the largest global commerce company moving a headquarters to our region is potentially a humongous economic boost. It may or may not be, right? right? And there's arguing about that. But the reason why they pushed this through and why every city competed to get it was the promise of this could happen. Moving the Capitals and the Wizards to a different location does none of that, right. and you have to know it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if the people who go to your games are either going to go in Washington or go in Virginia. It doesn't change that. That's right. We are You are not turning this into some kind of TikTok competitor. It's not. <laughs> so, like, don't... Like, you're going to have a hard time selling me that this is HQ2. It is not HQ2. Amazon moving there changed the literal name of the area. That's right. It's literally region-altering movement. Potomac Yards ain't becoming... Having them anchored here, having a global economic right. power anchored in our region potentially changes economics regionally for us. Moving the capitals to Virginia does not do that. They, they will yeah. not rename it Monumental Yards. No. no, all of a sudden the capitals and wizards are the bastion of economic growth. They're not. They're not. They're the bastion of economic growth for you. Correct. And that's why people don't want to hear that part of it. Mm -hmm. I understand the reasoning to do this. I agree that I'll still go to the games there. It doesn't bother me wh where they're locating it. I don't know if I'm going to drive there or not. You better fix that traffic part of it. However, don't tell me that this is on the same level as Amazon. Ted, you got to get out of your bubble if you think that way. Nobody's going to agree with you. That's right. That's right. Exactly. You're not Jeff Bezos. And the Capitals and Wizards don't have that kind of reach or economic vision. They're sports teams. That's right. Correct. Yeah. I appreciate them. I'm glad they're here. I will frequent their games, and I love them. And if they play in Virginia, I'll go. And if they play in Maryland, I'll go. If they play in Washington, I'll go. But don't tell me what you're Amazon. No. But <laughs> no. If they played in Glen Echo, I'd be there every night. <laughs> but no. But here, So he gets to this one. Yep. I'll take a break in a minute. He gets to this one, and I thought, which was very important, he keeps going through how everybody's everywhere and, and yep. all this growth is happening, all this business is happening. And then he names a lot of things that are growing in, in Virginia, which I've said a lot. Sure. This is why I think the Commander Stadium could go in Virginia. It's where I'd want to be demographically, financially. What's happening in our region is a lot of the young economic growth, demographic growth is happening in that part of that side of the river. So why wouldn't you put the place where people may go and spend their money, right? Anyway, so he says this, and this is a this is a really, really, really interesting stat. And I'm glad he used some data for once instead of all the what he wrote so yeah. far. Between the Capitals and the Wizards, 44% of the fans who attend the games are from Virginia. 41% yep. from Maryland, 15% yep. from Washington, D.C. These teams represent the DMV, and they belong to the entire DMV, and that will never change. I agree with this. Like, so... He's already telling you that the majority of fans who go to the games are living there. 3% more. Okay. I'm just, just saying. Okay. <laughs> I think more from Virginia will get season tickets or be frequenting it because sure. it is closer to them. Right. And then this, and then you ask the question, what number of the 41% from Maryland is going to change when it gets harder to get That's to? right. And that we don't know. From the D.C. ones, realistically, how much change would there really be? If you're core Wizards or Capitals fans, the Metro for you to Potomac Yards is really not that big of a deal. And you know it. it so, like, so, you know, for the D.C. fans, would there be a drop off? Maybe. Will I, Do I expect one? Not really. I expect the number to tilt more Virginia fans over Maryland fans just because of accessibility. But you might be surprised. It yeah. might not be as much as you think. I, I will say I'll push back a little bit on that. There are nights where you know how this goes, too. Where you're kind of like, eh, I don't know if I want to go to the game tonight. Because it is so easy to get to. I think you're going to lose some of those casual fans that go, yes. it's going to take me a little bit longer. I think you're going to get a I'm lot of, bother. okay, but I think you're going to get a lot of casual fans in areas of Virginia sure, sure. because it's accessible to right. them and very easy to get to. I, well, once again, I will believe it when I see it with the accessibility thing. You and I have lived here way too long to know 
this thing doesn't get solved week one. It takes a literal year to get it under under what you think it should be and then fixing it somehow. And a lot Let of times it doesn't get fixed. Route one going south is going to be an S show. <laughs> yes. Correct. Ted. Glenn. <laughs> Like, and if you don't know that, then you don't drive to work yes, every day correct. or ever go to National right. Airport or try to go down uh-huh. to that area just in rush hour to catch a dinner reservation in Old Town. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. That thing gets backed up and on a game night is going to be a you know what show. Correct. And, <laughs> and I don't know what you're going to do to fix that in the interim, but you better have a pretty solid plan to do it. Otherwise, to your point, when I do this once, I'll never drive there again. Right. I got a funny <laughs> feeling I'm going to miss the first period. And when you charge me $250 to go see the flames on a Tuesday and I miss the first period, trust me, I'm never doing it again, ever. And you will not get there in time for the one of 2,500 parking spots. That number still isn't big enough, by the way. <laughs> on the on the accessibility thing, he says this. I disagree with claims that this project would move the teams in a way that would reduce accessibility. The entertainment district will be 4.5 miles from Capital oh, One Arena, 2.6 miles from Washington, D.C.'s stop. border, <laughs> under one mile from Reagan National Airport, <laughs> Uh, At a couple hundred feet from the newly opened Potomac Yard Metro (laughs) Station, significant efforts are being made to study and optimize transportation Uh, options. The entertainment district will be a vibrant central location, blah, 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 with 2,500 underground parking spaces, dedicated rideshare drop-off, water taxi. There's your idea. Walking, running, and bike trails. No one walks, runs, or takes a bike to the game. (laughs) But whatever, I hear you. It's there. Okay, the water taxi, I think, might be interesting if it's actually efficient. The parking spaces sounds close to enough, I think. And the Metro better be able to handle it and better be running very quickly and vibrantly to pull this off. But, you know, I also disagree that this reduces accessibility. It will take a little longer for some people to go to this place However, I'll believe it when I see it yes. because I do agree that those fears are real. And when you just say significant efforts are being made to study and optimize this, how about we're already ahead of it? Which right. is, I really think, the better way to say this. Like, we understand this is a chief concern, and we're going to address exactly how this will be dealt with in a, the very near future. Because just saying we might do this and we're going to figure it out doesn't fly with me on that part. Uh, one pushback here. He says in the earlier paragraph that he drives to work, yet then says it's only 4.5 miles from right. Capital One Arena, 2.6 from the from the center. You and I know this. That, that was what we were dunking on people that were from the outside going, oh, it's only four miles away. We're like, no, dude, that four and a half miles is an hour. Four in, miles in, in, in rush hour Four traffic. miles <laughs> at 11 a.m. Is right. not four miles at 5 p.m. That's right. Four miles at 11 a.m. <laughs> might be 10 minutes. Correct. Four miles at 5 p.m. might be 14 hours. That's I'm right. not sure. That's right. So right. I, I hate yeah. that he went that route because I was like, no, you're from here. No. You know full well that those four miles, you are spinning the roulette wheel on what you could be I dealing agree. with on any day at any time, essentially. Boy, this is taking forever to go through it. I All right, you. be right back. Told you. <laughs> Brand Watch the Show, Expand 630 Sports Capital. 1971 is the year that we chose for very obvious reasons. That's the last time that Baltimore hosted the AFC Championship game. They, of course, then were the Baltimore Colts. And for the first time since then, so what is that? 53 years. Yep. 53 years later, the Ravens are going to host it on Sunday against the Kansas City Chiefs in a showdown of heavyweights. Which is crazy considering they've won two since getting here. Won two Super Bowls. And they've (laughs) been, yeah, they've been in the playoffs a number of times. They've just never hosted the AFC Championship, so they get this shot here this weekend. That's right, Han. What was going on at Pickles in 1971? (laughs) I don't think pickles existed. Uh, did it? I don't know. Who knows? I'll have to look know. that up. I don't know. It smells like it existed in 1971. <laughs> it smells like any dive bar. I'm saying that as a compliment. Yeah, yeah no. Totally, <laughs> I'm not totally. saying that as a criticism. I uh, I almost bought tickets because someone mistakenly listed some lower level tickets for less than like 300 bucks. Oh. And I was like. Did you do it? Nah, because we have our remote on Sunday. I'd so, let uh, you go early. Yeah. Take fine. off, go. It's fine. I, I mm-hmm. didn't know what I would have done at the game. Mm-hmm. Because I, I can't really, like, root for them. They're not my team. Yeah, but you're going to the AFC Championship know, game. That doesn't come around too often, as exemplified right. by 53 yeah. years. <laughs> right. Last time we had it here, 1991, the Detroit Lions were here. That's right. And then yep. the, that's the last time that the Lions had gotten this far ever, home or away, yeah. 
And here they are heading off to San Francisco this week. My buddy who's a Ravens fan was like, dude, you could have worn just worn all black and an Orioles hat. You would have been fine. I yeah. was like, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to Ted's letter, everyone. Uh, okay, let's get to the nitty gritty on the financing part of this thing. <laughs> okay. Sorry, didn't mean to laugh before you said Public anything. private partnership is how he describes <laughs> uh-huh. it. Sure, pal. He says this. <laughs> The entertainment district in Potomac Yard will require no upfront cash commitment by the Commonwealth of Virginia. No new taxes will be imposed on residents or businesses in Virginia. The Commonwealth will own the arena and will use its AAA credit rating to issue bonds <laughs> to raise funds for the construction. The bonds used to pay for construction will be paid back through lease payments paid by Monumental Sports and Entertainment, user fees for patrons, and the entertainment district, and taxes generated by the district, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Further, Monumental Sports and Entertainment will contribute over four hundred million dollars to the project this ain't free don't tell me it is right but you know if that is all true and i need to hear from the politicians yeah. if that is all true no new taxes and we are going to generate the money by you know putting out bonds and they will be repaid by lease payments okay hold on let me, let me, i'll hear you out on me. that i need tom sherwood here right now to explain to me whether that's true or not frankly i also am going to push back here he literally says out loud um Hold on. Uh, user fees for patrons of the entertainment district. So the number one thing you and me complain about as diehard sports fans is that Capitals games have gotten way too expensive. Yeah. Wizards games are way too expensive. So we're getting a resort so, fee. So we're going yeah. to raise ticket prices even more for one club that is about to lose their best superstar ever. And there's no end in sight to who that replacement could be. And another one who in my lifetime has had... I don't know, two and a half superstars the whole entire time and never sniffed you know, a championship. This like, is a good question for when he does do an interview with somebody, mm-hmm. which I hope happens in the next 10 years. Um, <laughs> project for me what it will cost to go to a Wizards game after you build this. Yes, please do. I think, you know, I think you know what the ticket price will be. Yes. And that'll be very telling uh-huh. here. Because if you're telling me, well, to pay for this project, we need you to pay $200 for an upper level ticket to a Wizards right. game. Well, yep. I don't even care about the accessibility anymore because I'm not going to go see the Jazz for two hundred dollars right. on a Thursday when you're seven and thirty-four. Oh, that's tonight. Um, yeah, that's that's what I'm getting at here. It's already expensive enough to go. So now you're saying for me, I'm just saying, and, and I live in Bethesda. I'm not out on you know near Shady Grove or Glenmont, where the furthest Caps fans come from. And there's a lot of Caps fans that come from both of those metro stations. You're now asking them to go further, pay more money. On top of everything else, and you and I both know this, it's going to be a new arena. Beers are going to be more expensive. Food's going to be more expensive. Everything's going to be more pricey. I'm just, I'm just saying, you're losing people with every sentence when you're when you're talking like that. Um, he also said this. I find the notion that sports arenas and stadiums do not provide economic economic benefit to be simply illogical. And he cites the original MCI Center transforming Chinatown, mm-hmm. Nationals Park transforming. Yep. The Navy Yard and, of course, uh, Camden Yards transforming the Inner Harbor. MIT Bank in to it, each yeah. of these cases, in each of these cases, the residential neighborhood part of this changed dramatically. Yes, agree. Is that what's happening here? Because the drawings I've seen right, looks actually. like a destination place for me to go in and out of. But we're not going to have America's youth moving in mass there like they did to Chinatown yeah. or they did to the Navy Yard. Yeah. So. I think there's a difference here unless I'm seeing the, I'm not seeing the project correctly. So I actually until I know what your plans are in terms of residential growth around it, mm-hmm. I don't agree with you. Right. It sounds like you're building Ted Land with a Virginia Tech campus and that but people are going in and out and leaving. They're not staying like the Navy Yard, Camden Yards or yeah. Chinatown. Right. They're going to build a barge. Really Nationals live on it. It, I would say this to Ted too because you know this because you're vacating this area. The building of Nationals Park at the Navy Yard cannibalized Chinatown for residents, and you know it. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yep. That's Absolutely. the truth of it. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's the truth of it. Uh, then he goes on to talk about Ward 7 and 8 because what are they going to do down there? That was our first question that day that that happened. Yes. Uh, here we finally got one where he yelled at us because um, he did in all capital letters. We prepaid the <laughs> lease payments for the entirety of the agreement with the entertainment and sports arena, which – 
he then goes to great lengths to explain is managed by Events DC, not by Monumental Sports. <laughs> it's up to them to fill this arena, which was you're passing the buck here because you know you're pulling things out of this place and you're then saying, well, they've got to deal with that, but they also build it thinking you're going to be right. housing these teams there and you're moving one of them out of there. Right. So that one's hard to swallow a little bit. And then he goes on to make a very long um, and then he goes on to talk about, and with that part down there, is he vacating something? Well, I guess if DC will have to figure out what to do with it, but he's basically, he says, we have no intention of abandoning it. He goes, the go-go are going to play there, but how many people are showing up to that? Right. And the esports stuff, it hasn't taken off, at least from a crowd perspective, like I think they thought they would. The Mystics obviously do very well down there, but he's talking about moving them out of it. Yeah. So what's going to happen down there? He's saying... Talk to Events DC about it, which I don't think is a very good answer for that he, part of it. I mean, and he, I think that's that's the least of my concerns of all of these things. But it is a concern, and I don't think he's addressing it properly. He's saying we we with we upheld our commitments. We did what we were supposed to do. We paid what we supposed to pay. We paid our bills. We put things down there. We are going to move one of these things away. And well, but it's just not our problem anymore because actually we're not in charge of it. He also okay um, that yeah. last, in that last paragraph he he uses my argument with the Mystics. They move to that arena, and they sell it out regularly. So now he wants to move them back to Capital One Arena because women's sports are ascending, yes. as he said. Here's the other problem: it's the same problem the Caps and the Wizards are going to have that we just talked about. Elena Deladon's not going to be with the Mystics. It's already been said that she's going to walk in free agency. Maybe we get They're, Caitlin Clark player. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're not getting her. Uh, she's gonna go. She's gonna play as much college as she can because she gets paid more. Eventually, but, she runs out of eligibility correct. unless they change that rule, which they should. <laughs> Nine years of eligibility for Caitlin Clark. Let's go. They uh, should. But here's what I'm getting at here too. It's the wrong timing again. You're gonna put them into a bigger arena when you don't have a superstar for everyone to go see that everyone's heard about, and it's not gonna sell out. So it's like you're moving the team again at the wrong time. You kind of botched your movement the first time, and now you're going to try to make it up for it. Like, good luck. Good luck. I, I'm just I'm just saying. But, yeah, I, I don't I don't buy that one. I know. That one's a tough one. And then he gets to Cap 1 Arena, and this one is lacking, too, because there's not a good answer to it. Yep. But he said this. I want to address the situation around Capital One Arena. We care about downtown Washington, D.C. We're proud of the years of support that we have provided. And that is why we would be open to the opportunity to maintain a presence by continuing to manage Capital One Arena through 2028 and beyond. We intend to continue to support downtown Washington, D.C. And we're confident that in working with the city, Capital One Arena can remain a vibrant part of the fabric of downtown Washington, D.C. for years to come. He goes, and then he says this, and at least it's an acknowledgement of one of the reasons why he's doing this. At the same time, it's clear to us and many of our neighboring businesses and residents in Chinatown that the needs of downtown Washington, D.C. and its businesses and residents are significant and challenging for the city. Just as Monumental Sports and Entertainment was part of the initial renaissance of downtown Washington, we would like to be part of the next renaissance. If that's the case, you wouldn't move the teams. And that's why I don't like that sentence mm -hmm. at all. Yep. Uh, because it seems to be you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. You're saying we want to support downtown D.C., but you're taking the anchor things away from it. And I appreciate if the city was up for this, that you'd move the Mystics there, and they probably would perform really well. But the reality is they'll be there 20 nights a year. That's it. Because that's, right. that's just their schedule. Mm -hmm. Like, if they're there, you know, a five times a week for the entire year, you know, and they have a residency, whatever, great. But they don't. So that's 20 nights. That's not going to cut it. Yeah. You know that. I know that. And this is very out of both sides of your mouth. We're moving out of here, but we care about this. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I know he has to address There's no way to address it. Yes, correct. correct. He I mean, can't. He tried. <laughs> and he did say the thing out loud that I've been talking about, too. This is a problem in that area yep. that is like to in his defense, they are an anchor for bringing thousands of people down there multiple nights a week all year. Right. Throughout the course of most of the year. Right. Well, the businesses around them are crumbling. The vacation of all of the office space is crumbling. The city isn't doing a lot about this. I do lay a lot of this blame on Muriel Bowser and the city leaders for allowing this to happen. At the same time, Ted, if you're going to make an argument that this is an economic boon by putting a stadium somewhere, you're watching the crumbling of one area by moving something out. And by the way, the new stadium that was built right across town from you, Nationals Park, is, I think, a predominant reason why young people moved away from Chinatown. It just became the hip new area to live. Yep, right. So, you know, like, you can't have it both ways. There is no, like, and this is the one he's going to have a hard time answering just in general because he is hurting the city by doing this. Correct. There's no way around it. I understand the reasons why he's doing it, 
And I also agree with him that the city on some level, and these are complicated issues that aren't easily solved. I don't want to pretend that they are, but they haven't been solved. They haven't been addressed in his, in, from his point of view. And I agree with him on a lot of that, which is why I think we got to this point. I think he also got this deal put in front of him. It was too good to be true. And he took it. Right. And, you know, and didn't really think through, I think, this part of it. Now he's trying to both sides of his mouth explain that, like, we do want to keep a presence here. For Why in the world would the city maintain that arena, whatever it costs to do it, when you've got who knows how many events going on there? That's right. Right. It's exactly. a white elephant. You know it. So what are we going to do with it? Yeah. And he doesn't really address that part of it. Correct. Exactly. There's not enough to go around because you and I have talked about this, too. Is he going to let the better concerts go to Capital One Arena? Of course not. No. It's, it's going to go to his new one. one. Right. <laughs> so, of course not. So here's what I like. Here are the things I want to hear from you, Ted. One, I want the detailed traffic plan. Yes. What are I, you I, actually I, doing? That's literally the most important part about okay. this new arena. Seriously. One, that's what detailed traffic plan. Two. Explain to me how much it's going to cost to go to a Caps or a Wizards game mm-hmm. because you and I both know we're footing the bill for this. You could say it's not through bonds yeah, and right. this and leases and that. No, it's going to be in ticket prices and concession prices. What will it cost me to buy four tickets to a Capitals game when you move there? I know you know the projections. Tell me. Yeah. You know what the salary caps are going to be. You know everything. <laughs> you know what it's going to cost to do this. You tell me what I'm paying to make this happen. And then three... I want a detailed plan of what we're going to do with Capital Run Arena that makes sense for the city. Not for you, what makes sense for the city. And if you can answer those three questions in a way that I find or that all of us find, okay, we can get on board with this plan, I think you'd get more people. Don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. Don't tell me it doesn't cost Virginia something or doesn't cost me something to do it. And don't tell me it's going to be really easy to get to. Those are not true. None of that is true. Those are the three things that you need to explain to me why this is all going to be okay. And if you can do that, then I think actually the one DMB thing, I'll wear a shirt that says Ted's one DMB. I'm on board. I'm on board. One DMV, everyone. I have no comment on that. <laughs> Is that good? Uh, any other points he needs to explain? Well, the to you? last Those one. are the three to me. That's no, it. I would agree with the Traffic, last. detailed plan, cost to go to your games after you build this thing, and what we can realistically do with Capital One Arena that's good for the city and not just good for you. I mean, you buried the last point, though, and that was space. And that's where the one where DC was never going to be able Correct. to, to com- ever compete. I didn't even talk about that because I agree with him on that part. Yeah. Like, I didn't say I don't sure. disagree with all this. Right. They don't have this. They've outgrown the space. I agree with him on all of that. Here's the thing, though. He should have led with that. He should have just said straight up, there's no way we could get exactly what we want from the city unless we're going to RFK or whatever or another space in the city. Because yeah. really, when you do lay that out, everyone that lives here knows that's pretty much the reason. And we all, whether you whether you love or hate it, going to Virginia, we all can agree, okay, you want a legitimate facility for all your teams, you're not going to get that within the city unless you buy up multiple buildings, which you and I both know he's not going to do. Yes, So agreed. All right, let me take a quick break, and let's not bury the lead any longer. <laughs> Wes Unsell Jr. is no longer the coach oh, of the happened. Wizards. We'll talk about that next. Brain Watch the Show, ESPN 630 Sports Capital. Throwback Thursday, 1971. We have chosen that year this week because the Ravens are hosting the AFC Championship game against Kansas City this weekend. And 1971 was the last time the city of Baltimore had that event there. The Baltimore Colts hosted it back 53 years ago. Here's the Ravens with a shot uh, with the what I think is the likely MVP winner in Lamar Jackson. The candidates came out the top five yep. today. Dak Prescott, Lamar Jackson, Brock Purdy, Christian McCaffrey, and I can't remember who the other one was. It must not be someone who's seriously in consideration <laughs> if I can't remember who it is. Uh, but it should be an incredible game this weekend. I'm going to play a piece from uh, John Harbaugh in a little bit where he explained where he was in 1971, <laughs> and it's incredible context, actually, to hear it. Um, all right, let me get into the other Wizards news today, which was, uh, you know, for me, preempted by Ted's very long letter about why they're doing the Potomac Yards thing in the first, what I thought was expansive commentary from him about what he's going to do. He's held a press conference, but it wasn't a press conference. He took no questions. Right. Still hasn't through all of this. Hasn't really talked a lot about Qatar either, frankly. So, like, there's been a lot here over the last Correct. year where Ted's not as uh, 
open to the media as he has been in the past. And I would describe that as, in my opinion, a major criticism of him because I really don't think that he's not good with the media. He's very good with the yeah. media, but maybe he just doesn't feel like he wants to explain himself these days. Not to so, mention you yeah. and I, uh, I, well, not just you and I, but this whole region, uh, because of the Redskins and the commanders, uh, we kind of know how to look at situations and assess them instead yeah. of just taking the news. And it's like, we have whiz bots for years. We have uh, Darren Ravel tweeting about how he's such a good owner. Then we have Jose Andres tweeting how he's such a good owner. You and I know this. Ted plays the PR game as well. That's happening right in front of yes. our eyes as, t- as well. So. Uh, let's see. Halfway into the season, Wes Unsell Jr. is out as the head coach. In between he's, a back-to-back, by the way. In between a back-to-back, he's getting moved to an unnamed front office position. So first question I have is the question I had the day it happened. Why did they give him an extension on right. his contract? And right. again, this is one of those... It's not my money to spend, but it made no sense at the time. I didn't really totally understand it, and I don't know how 7 and 36 changes that at all, that right. dynamic. Did they think he was doing a different job than what was happening? I think we all knew what the score was. He had a team he couldn't win with. Correct, yeah. But I think maybe they're just at the point where it doesn't even look like it's jibing in any kind of way that feels I like guess. a direction forward. So I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't totally understand this, and you know, Ted's not you know, cold-hearted. Yes. So, sir. Yeah. and that last name, the second they hired him, I said, "Well, you're gonna have a hard time firing him. That's right. You know, like yep. you're gonna have a hard time doing it. So you better give a soft landing to him." And they did. And he probably wants to be a coach again, and he probably will leave and go be a coach somewhere else. Right. You know, as probably an assistant somewhere else. Uh, but but they gave him the soft landing by giving him a job, and they're gonna pay him. And I just I never understood that. I thought it was a weird message to send to everybody. I'm like. They haven't really done anything with teams that should have been competitive and weren't. Yep. And now they got a team that isn't competitive and they're like, they look woeful. Yes. So I don't, I never understood what was going on there. Yeah. What, what I don't really understand in general too, is you knew what the season was going to be. You don't have a superstar. You have a roster that's not set to win. You actually told us out loud that you weren't going to win this year. So where's the disconnect here? I, I, I agree. I don't understand it. Yeah, right. I, I don't know. And then there's either. this. Okay, so Shams is on whatever he's on. I can't remember, FanDuel or something like that. Yeah, FanDuel. Yeah. And, um, and he was asked about the Wizards situation, and he said this. At 5.13 this morning, I had a notification. <laughs> that is too early for a Shams scoop, but yet. Was it really 5.13? It was 5.13. I'll never forget it. Um, <laughs> what happened? Wes Unsell Jr. out as head coach of the Washington Wizards, and this is something, this is a team that has, has struggled, obviously, this season uh, to get wins. They're, they're in a devel- de- developmental stage in their, in their franchise. Michael Winger came in as the president, uh, Will Dawkins as the, as the general manager, and the firing was going to take place over the summer, regardless of, of oh. really how the, how the season was going to go. That's what a lot of people around the league believed. So the Wizards get a head start on their coaching process, but also are able to continue their development from within. Um, the, the job simply had changed from when uh, uh, Wes Unsell Jr. had come over. I mean, this, that was a team that was, was thought to be competitive okay. in these two we, don't, like, we know the history. This was going to happen in the summer? Right. Again. Why did you give him the extension? Why did you give him an extension? <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't understand. So I, I just don't under. What were they just like? Thanks for doing this. We're going to give you some more money, but we well, are going to fire you. Like, I will say what, this. What, it was that it? I will say this. It was his last year of his contract, wasn't it? So, and then they gave him his, an extra did year. Did his agent and him go to the team and go, "We're not going into this as a lame duck Maybe. season because we know and what's about to happen." Kind Ted's of like, "I'll hook Wes up. It's right. Wes's kid." Yeah, because because uh, to be fair, he's going. You're telling the public we're going to be bad. Right. How do I? How do I get better as a coach this year? I, I guess, <laughs> but you know, it it is it is show me like with the process stuff with Brett Brown. Yeah, everybody thought he was a very good coach. Yeah, that's right. No, nobody right. nobody thought he wasn't. They just knew he was handed a he was he was given a hand he couldn't win with. That's right. You yeah, know, yeah. he knew that. All right, one other clip I want to play for you because Kevin Durant was asked about uh, the elevation of Brian Keefe yep. to be the interim coach. Mm-hmm. All right, <laughs> wait till you hear this. Okay, this is Kevin Durant on him. Thanks, man. Some of the best, probably the best memories I had so far in this league. You know, he taught me everything I know about you know, work ethic, being a pro. Uh, he wouldn't take any credit for it, but he taught me everything I know. Uh, as far as how I approach you know, shoot arounds, practices, games, you know, workout sessions, you know, just everything. It just changed my, my mindset. Since I was met him when I was 18, so since from 18, probably 25, you know, he's been grooming me into you know, the player that I am today. So I owe a 
lot to him. Like I said, he probably won't take the credit, but he's, he's, he's the like, most influential guys that, um, that I know in this business and this game and in life. So, you know, I got nothing but love and respect for, for uh, BK. I wish he could do an interview not next to yeah, the no, practice, yeah, yeah. but whatever. But Okay, so this guy was part of the coaching staff 2012. He's been around a long time, right? And the 2012 Thunder coaching staff, they got to the finals. That's when they still had yep. Russ Harden and KD, young players at the time. Um, and so I'm like thinking about this. I'm hearing Kevin Durant say this. He taught me everything I know, big part of my growth and mm-hmm. maturity and potential and all this stuff. He's on the staff here now. Yep. Winger and Dawkins came in, Dawkins straight from the Oklahoma City situation. Yeah. Why didn't they make him the head coach in the first place? After hearing that, it's almost like, why don't you just install your guy in the first place? If he's got this kind of reputation working with players, you know how he works because you've worked with him intimately. What? What is this? Why? Because you had to try Wes, I guess. Really? I, I guess. Because by Ted directive? I guess probably. So I this guess. was the one thing that probably. Ted is this the Dan said you got to play Haskins. Yep, that's right. And Ted said we'll give you all the leeway to do anything you want, right. but Wes is the coach. Also, and then it got to the middle of the season, and they're seven and thirty-six, and they went Ted. Well, while the, you're putting out this letter, you want us to deflect for you for a minute because it is time to do something like this. It's also no offense to to like Brad or anything, but the number one thing with Wes and bringing him in was what he got Denver to play defense really well, right? Yes. And so I think everyone was kind of saying, with Brad out, let's see what he does. And instead, they're giving up 140 points to everybody. They so. also have an extraordinarily <laughs> flawed roster. Of course, in, no, no, in no, West, it, there's not much to defend West right. with. But on that part, like, come on, he can't win with this. And they have a ridiculously flawed roster. Sure. He has no interior game. Yeah. So, I mean, come on. Like, there's only so much you're going to be able to do, realistically. Yeah. But to hear him say that, and then this guy's already on the staff and has this long history with the new front office and is known for working with superstars and they openly talk about how great he is. It's like, well, why wasn't he the coach from day one then? Right, right. What I actually hate the most about this is that Phoenix is good again. And I had said to you, KD was going to ask for a trade by the end of the year. Yeah. No. It was ripe to come here. If he loves him so much. Maybe. He doesn't want to come back here. That was his thing. You don't know that. Come back here and do what? Win with what? I don't know. Him and Bilal, that's it? that's right. Him and Bilal. Let's go. Whiz, baby. I mean, I'd go. Yeah, <laughs> Duh, we'd I'll, all go. I'll pay your $500 tickets, it's Ted, to go to that one. And I'll wait four, four and a half hours on Route 1 to get there. Can't wait. All right, be right back. Brad Bush is always being 630. It's worth capital. This is a banger from 1971. Throwback Thursday. Tom Jones. Whenever you see Tom Jones on all the list, timer. makes it every time. <laughs> All-timer. 1971 was chosen this week for Throwback Thursday because the Ravens are hosting the AFC Championship. And the last time that Baltimore hosted the AFC Championship game was 1971. It's the Baltimore Colts. You, Amazing. You might, you might be the yeah. first person in the history of music to uh, describe She's a Lady as a quote-unquote banger. From 1971, <laughs> it was. <laughs> Not anymore. But in 1971, I was correct. There was some gyrating going on there, some chest hair being shown that made the ladies go wild. Every time. That I... would be nothing these days. But, you know, That's but right. then in 1971, that was the little risque. A lot of chest yeah. hair. A lot of chest hair. Tom Jones there. A lot of chest hair. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Every time Tom Jones comes on, it reminds me of Mars Attacks. Do you remember yeah. that? Do you remember that movie? Mars Attacks. Mars Attacks? Yes. Yes. yes I'm just saying. He's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I meant to do this last hour. Sorry. I'll do it right now. You want to win a trip to Las Vegas during the weekend of the big game? Enter now for your chance to win a trip for two to Las Vegas, which includes airfare, two-night stay at the Fountain Blue, which is brand new out in Vegas, a $150 credit, two tickets to the Fountain Blue Las Vegas big game viewing party at Blue Live Theater. All you got to do today is text the word WATCH to 95819. That's WATCH to 95819. Standard messaging and data rates may apply. Contest rules at sportscapitaldc.com slash contests. All right, let's get into all the NFL movement today. Yep. Uh, with all the stuff that Ted did, boy, he just took up the whole hour, didn't he? Wesley is moving to the front office. I'm not concerned about parking or transportation. I think DC is going to be vibrant forever. Okay, okay. I want to chime in on one more <laughs> and thing. And Wizards games are going to cost $800 a piece. I want to chime in on one more thing, too. Uh, 2,500 parking spaces, and you already told me we're going to be footing the bill with a little, a little bit of fees there. Hundred dollars a spot. Yeah, what's it gonna cost? I mean, I'm not joking. Hundred dollars a spot if you want one under the arena. Because yeah. that's what it sounds I like. I have questions, Ted. I is, think we all do, it, and I want some answers. And when it me. rains, will my car be on stilts? Because mm-hmm. I'm concerned about the flooding over there. Yes. Uh, let's see. From the NFL, let's start with the news today. Yep. The Panthers' job is filled. Dave Canales, who is the offensive coordinator in Tampa, and you know, I think is clearly is doing something right. Yep. He's the one that was in Seattle last year and Geno Smith's career turned around and had a Pro Bowl caliber year and yep. the Seahawks ended up in the playoffs and 
you know, I think that's some of that is just Gino hanging around the league long enough to get that second chance. But he had a really great year. And guess what? When Dave Canales wasn't there and was in Tampa, Gino Smith's year was average. So much so that there was an argument whether Drew Locke should be playing. And I think by the end of it, we were like, you're getting the same from either one of them. That's right. Yep. And they could really go either way. And they probably need an upgrade at the position. But he did a good job there. Yep. Goes to Tampa. Well, Baker <laughs> Mayfield looked like a real starting NFL quarterback. So much so that they win a bad division, but they won it. Yeah. They get to the playoffs. They win a playoff game. And oh, by the way, they scared the you-know-what out of the Lions on the road last weekend. And Baker has earned himself a big, fat next contract. Yeah. So laugh if you want at the Panthers, but I, I don't know. This guy knows what he's doing, too. And guess what he's working with? A quarterback who needs to take a big-time next step. This is different. Baker's been around the block a long time. So is Geno Smith. This yep. is a different situation. But the hiring screams to me like they got a guy that they needed, actually. Now, whether he has any power, whether he's going to get undermined, we've right. lived that, you know, yeah. because of the way the owner has acted. But in terms of just a pure hiring for what they need, it is hard to argue that they didn't pick somebody that might help Bryce Young take the next step, and that's exactly what they need right now. Not only was Baker great, he made throws in that Lions game that were the best throws I've ever seen him throw. Yeah. Like that last drive when they when they got before they got jobbed on the two point conversion, he had three completions that I was like, "Whoa, I've never seen that dude make those types of throws on that type of decision." You have to be. You have to know what you're doing if you're getting Baker to do things like that. And are you going to, I don't know if you're going to agree with my conspiracy theory here. I think they moved on him fast because they know they're not getting Ben Johnson. I feel like Correct. that's, that's my, that's, that's, well, I think we're down to two for that one. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's us and the Falcons. Yes. Like right. I want, we can talk about that in a minute, yep. but like, I agree with you. Like this is a good sign yes. that this is in the bank. Mm -hmm. Like, like the Panthers, yep. you know, I, I was worried all along. They're going to throw the bank at him. And there in lie, because that's what Snyder used to do. Right. Dump the money on the driveway. I dare you to say no to it. Right. Well, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So they went and hired their guy, takes them off the board. This is good news for us because I think we know who we want. And the field is getting cleared more and more and more. It'd make me really happy if the Falcons just hired Belichick or Vrabel already. <laughs> right, but the right. fact that they have it says they're the ones we need to be concerned about. And then there's Seattle's job is still open. And they've been cagey. Yes. They're the ones that have been real cagey about like, We've said who we're interviewing. Uh, the Chargers went and got their guy. I'll get to Harbaugh in a minute. Yeah. The Panthers now went and got They were quiet about it, but they went and got their guy. The Falcons have been open about what they're doing. Seahawks haven't said word one about what they're doing. You're not hearing anything we're about the last what's going three, on right? there. Seahawks, Falcons, That's us. It. Correct. Okay. All right. Well. And there's a lot of good candidates left. Yes. Yeah. That, as I said, I, I was the first one to say it. The, the musical chairs were going to fill up fast. Yes. There's going to be legit candidates to be coordinators. Yeah. I mean, this is what's screaming for us is I'll get back to Canals in a second because I got a hot take for you. But okay. like, yeah. um, but this, what's screaming now to us is this. Like, it's between Ben Johnson or Dan Quinn. Yep. For us. Yep. And I think Dan Quinn's our fallback mm -hmm. if we lose Johnson to Atlanta or maybe Seattle, who I think is quietly lurking here. All along, I've been like, Dan Quinn's going there. That would take them off the board. Yeah. Well, that hasn't happened yet. Right. And so, I don't know. And then the Falcons, I think we're leaning of the Belichick, Harbaugh, Rabel variety, which that means they're just in a different place than we are. We're not looking at that person. Like, yeah. we didn't interview Jim Harbaugh. We haven't brought in Rabel, and we didn't want to talk to Belichick. So, we're hoping, yeah, 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 take him, because... Not that they're hiring a bad guy. They aren't. Yeah. But we're just not there, which would leave us in one other place, and we're sitting there going, we're going to end up with our guy. Well, it seems like that we're not exactly there right now. Mm -hmm. Bobby Slowick apparently had a second interview with Atlanta. He's also had it here. Maybe they'll go with him. If they do that, then it's mano y mano, and one's getting Ben Johnson and the other's getting Dan Quinn. Yeah. And I will then be surprised that Mike McDonald ended up not being a serious candidate to be waited out for by anybody, if that's how it goes. Right. And then, you know, maybe the third fallback for us would be McDonald. That's a possibility, too. The way it's shaping up right now, we are either going to get Ben Johnson, who I think is the top target, and then either Dan Quinn or Mike McDonald. The McDonald stuff's been very quiet, but the fact that jobs are filling up and no one's waiting him out is a little surprising to me, actually. I do think it, there's a difference because with McDonald... It feels like defensive coaches are just a set tier, a line. 
Whereas Quinn, Vrabel, McDonald, McDonald's, I don't know if McDonald's younger. There's but been he's, others. But I mean, D'Amico Ryan's had a market, and then Houston gave him a big deal to sure. secure him. Like, they but made that not, happen. But there's not a D'Amico Ryan's this time around. Everyone seems well, to I be. I think McDonald's might be. That's the thing. I think he might be. I Go think, look at what they're doing. I think what's happening here, though, is that all, I think McDonald, though, is so close to Vrabel and Quinn that they're all looked at in the same tier. So I don't, I don't think people are waiting around for McDonald. Is probably what it is. I got to tell you, if I'm like a competitor of that team, like the Panthers just picked off the guy that made Baker good. Yes. That's right. a good move for yeah, them. Yeah, right. If I'm an AFC team, I'm looking at that going, we got to break that up. Right. Like that's, yeah. that's, going, <laughs> that's going a little too good over there. <laughs> right. We get that guy out of there. <laughs> like that guy, that's, that's going too good. Yeah. All right, you want my hot take on uh, Tampa now? All right. All right. So uh, Geno Smith had a career turnaround. This guy was the offensive coordinator there. Yep. Goes down to Tampa. Baker Mayfield has a career turnaround there. I don't think that's a coincidence. I sure. think the guy clearly knows what he's doing with quarterbacks. Right. Now that he leaves, you paying Baker Mayfield $30 million to $40 million a year? Because if I'm Tampa Bay, I might want to think about that now. That guy's not in his ear every day now. Look what happened with Geno Smith. He ended up being average. He's fine. Yeah. You know, average. That could be the same thing here with Baker Mayfield. I would be worried. And maybe they don't have a better option. You run the risk of Baker walking to Carolina, though. How? Big up Bryce Young. No, no, of course. But you always bring a veteran in that... Not for $30 million. He's going to get something. Like, you know how this goes. A team that doesn't have a quarterback yeah. gives the money up. Right. Well, so that he's not going with them. Okay. Carolina's not Fair happening. Like, he will go somewhere else that right. doesn't have a quarterback. So, I'm just hot taking here a little bit. Right. If I'm Tampa, I loved what happened with Baker Mayfield. I now know what the going rate is for him. The guy who was there that actually got him to play to this level isn't here anymore. Am I concerned that I'm going to spend $30 million for an extremely average quarterback? Right. I don't want to do that. So watch them around the draft. Well, they, see, that's, this is where the draft should always go first because they got to make the decision in free agency. Yes, correct. Exactly. You have to make that choice before the draft comes around. Because they could be players for Kirk, too. 100%. Good wide receivers. Uh, that's clearly if Baker liked the area. I'm sure Kirk, Kirk will probably settle in there, too. Like Maybe they go, we don't want to give this guy $30, $40 million a year. We'll draft Michael Penix. Right. Kirk, uh, political career, could start in Florida. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll draft J.J. McCarthy. <laughs> Watch. I, I, I think Tampa is going to have to be very serious about thinking about Baker now that this guy's gone. Yeah, seriously think about that. I think that's that's not that's not a bad take. Yeah. And they're also they're also their veterans are aging too. It's not like they have a bad team, but they're getting Mike up Evans there in might age. not be back. Right. They're like, getting up there in age. Right. Mike Evans might not be back. Yep. A lot of those guys on defense, they're like Hall of Fame caliber players. They're all older now. Yeah, right. Like they already went through a cap hell situation with Brady. Yep. So they're kind of through the other side of that. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. You know, like the easy answer and the logical answer is look at the year he had. We found our quarterback. Let's bring him back. I've seen this before. You think he's going to ascend to be a great? Because I actually don't. I think he's turned into a good professional quarterback, but he's not great. But now you're going to pay the rate for him to be that way. I might I might argue, nope, we're going to let you walk. That division is so funny because I don't think anyone wants to have a quote-unquote reset year because the division is so winnable. I think that's the, yeah, funny, part. I think that's the funny part about it. I think well, like, like if, the, if the Bucks were in the NFC East and it was the Cowboys and Eagles ahead of them, they'd probably go, Let's take a year to hit the reset button. We're not going to rebuild. But if I'm Baker, I call up Atlanta tomorrow and right. go. You don't want? They don't want me. I'll go to play with you and your right. skill position right. guys. Right, but they're also. But and Tampa's going. Man, if we lose this division, it, it's a bad look because it's very winnable. Like I, I think mean, that's the funny you part. Know, are they someone that would think about trading up? Are they someone who would sit back and wait for McCarthy or Penix? Right. Maybe. 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 I could see it. Yeah, I could see that. Um, as for Jim Harbaugh, you know, worst kept secret. <laughs> He was coming back to the NFL. He wouldn't answer us. questions about it, you know, like going into the championship game. I don't blame him. Right. Um, he, you know, won't really answer questions really about anything. The Chargers brass was asked, will you spend money? And they had to yell and scream that they will, which everyone knew what that meant. Um, this was, you know, everyone believes this, that you walk into a good situation with Justin Herbert. You know, it's different than some of these other places. You do have a top tier caliber quarterback. So you turn things around there. It can turn around fast. They got a basketball team for skill position players. I think their defense is underachieved. And um, boy, that's a that is an incredible division now. Yep. Andy Reid, Jim Harbaugh, Sean Payton are all coaching in it. Crazy. I wish Antonio Pierce a lot of luck with yeah, that. Yeah, good luck. With that's that. a, it's a tough spot. <laughs> I mean, these are all like 
Two of them have won Super Bowls. One of them has won multiple Super Bowls. The other guy was in the NFC Championship three years in a row and has won everywhere he's been and just won the national championship. Right. Wish you a lot of luck with that. That's going to be tough. I hope Harbaugh goes after the enemy. I think they'd be a match made in heaven. To be the offensive coordinator there? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I mean, like, Jim played there. The enemy obviously played there. Yep. Um, I haven't heard much about him and where he's going to go. Saying, I actually I, saw my boy Nagandi tweet out that he thinks the Eagles ought to go after Bienemy as the uh, offensive coordinator since there's an opening there and since Nick Sirianni has been neutered like in all of his like like duties, which was pointed out to him publicly by the Eagles media yesterday. <laughs> I'm going to get to that in a bit, too, because that was one of the most... Uh, did you see any of this? I didn't. I didn't. This was so awkward. It's it's impossible to describe how awkward this was yesterday up there, where they're trying to explain what he does now. Oh god, it was pretty bad. Anyway, um, oh, I was gonna listen. Say- I think the Chargers. It's a home run. Yep. If any of their fans don't think this is a this is the polar opposite of what they just had in a coach. This guy's won everywhere. He might be really salty, and you may, after a couple of years, be like, I can't even be in the same room with this guy. Mm. But I guarantee you they're going to be way more competitive than they've been. And I bet with that quarterback, they win a lot. I'm complete opposite. Oh, you think it's going to go south? I, I don't. He's think. never gone south, though. That would be a first for him. He has won literally everywhere he's been, and he's won big literally everywhere he's he been. He's such a weirdo for L.A. I agree. It's a weird mix. I'm just saying. I, I, just, I have a bad feeling about it. That he and Herbert. Herbert's very chill. He's not... They're complete opposites when it comes to that. Like, Harbaugh, to me, in the best way I can describe him possibly, is the cult leader that offers you the Kool-Aid. And if you don't drink the Kool-Aid, you're on his bad side. Yeah, probably. But it sounds like most of the time people get on board and drink the Kool-Aid. Look at what happened in Michigan. That was a cult by the end of the year. Correct. They were weird. But that's, you're right, but that's college kids that are easily influenced and buy into the M on the side of their helmets. I mean, I hear you. The M on the the shirt. Did you think that, okay, is San Francisco a place? You thought his personality would jibe? It's different, though, even from 10, 12 years ago. You know this. It's already become even more of a player's league now. All it takes is a few of those guys to go, I'm not messing with this joker, and he's going to lose the locker room. I I don't buy it. I'm just saying, I don't buy it. I think... He's and and any of those guys that do that, I think he'll just eradicate out quickly and go. Sure. You guys haven't won anything. Sure, I think that's fine. So go ahead and tell me. Okay, I'll should let me. He's gonna throw the rings on the table and go. <laughs> oh, you guys don't like what we're doing here now, and, and like and he's what not, Super Bowl rings though. It's been pretty darn close. I know. Those I know. players on that team haven't won jack nothing. Sure. They like barely make the playoffs and blow huge leads to Jacksonville. <laughs> that's the closest they've come to sniffing anything. That's fair. That's right? That's fair. So it's the same thing like, you know, like on the B enemy thing, where there's always an argument. Was it too much? Was he too pushy? Whatever. Like, you know, was it too much? I would argue y'all haven't won anything, done nothing. You've been ranked in the bottom third in offense. Who are you to tell him with his Super Bowl rings, oh, it's too hard around here? Right. Oh, really? Sure. Is it? Right, right, right. So I think Harbaugh's going to come in with the same thing. But, you know, in the end, everybody falls into the cult of Harbaugh with him. I don't know how and I don't know why. And I kind of want to be a fly on the wall for it because he seems like the type of dude that wouldn't get people to buy in that way. But they have over and over and over. So to me, all right, we can disagree to this. I think it's a home run. And I think they will be far better next year overnight. Like, this is not a rebuild. Overnight, they're going to be way more competitive than they were. To me, best case scenario, he is the in-between basketball coach that resets the culture, gets those guys close. They eventually fire him for the next hot head coach, and that's mm. who gets him over. That's, I think, the best case scenario. Okay. When they walk in the first day, it's going to be, do you want the blue Kool-Aid or do you want the yellow Kool-Aid? Yeah. That's going to be day one. Okay. What's your general reaction to Dan Quinn third interview here scheduled for next week? Is he... 1A, if Ben Johnson doesn't take the job here and selects either Atlanta or Seattle, because like Seattle's been cagey yep. here. But it sounds like maybe it's... A, if Atlanta strikes out on the big names, which is mm. sounds like... Well, it sounds like they could get Vrabel. Yeah, <laughs> like, right, right, yeah, yeah. If they want Vrabel. Yeah. But if they, if they decide they don't want Vrabel now, they're clearly going to eye Ben Johnson. So if we lose on him... Mm-hmm. Is that what it is now? I Dan think so. Quinn's one A. I think so. I think it was over uh, McDonald. I guess. I think it was uh, uh, Chris Russell who I saw tweet that there that Dan Quinn was the one, not the one, but was mutually interested. Like he was interested in this job. 
Mm. And once again, yeah, people don't know that part that a lot of the coaches go through this process. They always say like, oh, they passed him over. You know, a lot of them go into it going, it's nice to meet you. Yes. I'm looking at. Yes. And so what it's I'm, mutual that like the two sides have to agree with. One exactly. hundred yeah. percent. And so that's where I've kind of perked up with Quinn is what does Quinn know that we don't know? Like, does he know how to unlock this defense? Does he know how to turn the key? Well, now that some of that up? major talent's gone, I'd, be, sure, I'd have a hard argument with him because he doesn't Micah. have a Micah Parsons here. Correct, but remember, they lost their best playmaking cornerback the first month of the season and were fine. And granted, I get they're stacked. They're, they're stacked all across the board. But does he look at this defense and go, I can work with those two D tackles? I can work Definitively, with, yes. Yeah, right, right, right. If, if yeah. both of them want to stick yeah. around. Uh, I can work with uh, that safety Cam Crow. We got to resign him. I can work with some of those pieces and get this thing going. He certainly knows our team. Right. See, that's the other part here. Really He's well. watched us closely. He knows so, our team really well. Say what you want, but he has at least studied us, and I would I would make this argument, too. I think he's probably looked at the offense and go, I know who can unlock that offense, too, with whoever the quarterback is. Well, I want to know. If we're going to hire him, I want to know who the coordinator of is. Of course. Yeah, Big yeah. time. Yeah, of course. Because we're drafting a quarterback, yes. guys. Yeah, 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 I mean, right, like, right. that's happening. Sure. But here's the thing, too. It's not like he's been wrong on that. When he was with the Falcons, it was Kyle Shanahan, and they got to the Super Bowl. So he has an eye for finding a good counterpart to be his offensive Kellen coordinator. Kellen Moore. Oh, God. Who, by the way, is up say what I, was say. Yeah, I don't want to say what I was going to say, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't like that. No? You don't like <laughs> don't that? that? You don't like that? No. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think um, this reads to me like he is 1A, actually. Yeah. Right. I maybe this Mike McDonald guy is either not expressing a lot of interest in other jobs, which is possible. Sure. That's what Ben Could Johnson be. did a year ago. Could be. Or um isn't interviewing very well because these the everybody's waiting on this Ben Johnson guy, right? Yes. No one seems to be waiting on him. Hey, people could be. That's, s- maybe Seattle. Maybe that's what Seattle. Maybe Seattle's waiting on him. That's what could be happening. Also though, I just don't know what they're doing. I know what Atlanta's trying to do, and I know what we're trying to do. I don't know what they're trying to do. To my point, though, before, too, where maybe it's spooking people because he's a first-year head coach, but Quinn and Rabel are sitting right there. They're going, if we're going to go with a defensive guy, why not go with one of those two who have actually been good head coaches? So maybe the upside's a little bit better on taking one of those other two guys over him because it kind of, I'm sure, freaks guys out to take a first-time head coach. I I, I will say this, too, for Seattle um, with McDonald. Mm -hmm. Look at what he did to San Francisco. Yep. Look yep. at what he just did to Houston. Mm-hmm. And if I'm Seattle and you're countering Shanahan and McVay twice a year every year, yeah. you can't keep up with them offensively because you don't have the quarterback yet. But you do. And I, I saw this firsthand. They have a real good group of budding talent on the defensive side of the ball. They're missing a couple people, but not a lot. Like yeah. they're kind of, their secondary is going to be elite good. Maybe they're eyeing, maybe that's what they're doing, that they're quiet with him, and maybe he's because we always thought Quinn was going there. Right, right. Well, why does he keep doing all these interviews all these other places? Why haven't they just grabbed him? Maybe they're the ones going after McDonald going, we got to counter what they're doing, Shanahan and McVay are doing. Maybe. And he's the one that seems to know how to handle that offense. Right. He's the only one. They, they went down to San Francisco and embarrassed them. Right. Totally embarrassed them. Embarrassed Purdy. Made them look terrible. And maybe that's the one where they went, go get that guy. Right. We got the defense to be that, and then it's going to be War of the Worlds. Shanahan versus McDonald, <laughs> right? War of the Worlds. Could be. 